a lot of discussion about uh, filming. And I had a racist remark said to me in the dentist office, which I told you about. Mm -hmm. But the idea here was from a white hygienist, if the police just had a way to turn off all of the phones around them, then these films wouldn't be made and we wouldn't have to worry about all this. I just wanted to throw that comment in. Yeah. Thank you. Thank and you. just to clarify, that film did start in the middle of the interaction. Um, there was another comment that uh, it seemed like he started filming at the beginning of the conversation, but he had already asked her to leash her dog and she, she wasn't doing that. Um, when he started filming, she was already in a state of stress or, um, or was exhibiting those symptoms. Thank you. So, you know, um, what I do want to emphasize, this idea of racialization, which, which is the, the, the classification of people, right, um, in, in, based on an economic system, so within this white supremacist framework, combined with this propaganda of white racial ideology, it creates, right, this false sense of superiority in whites. And it's specifically designed to be hidden and masked through white normativity, right? So there, and I hope that this presentation has kind of helped um, you maybe just begin to see how uh, white racial, racial ideology is hidden and, and masked, you know, how we've been taught to do this over time. Um, and, and, you know, this idea of a false sense of superiority, we could definitely see in Amy Cooper's video, this, this, this sense of superiority that she felt um, as a white person. So I just wanna talk about this idea of ignorance because when you think about hidden and masked, right? Um, we often, <laughs> one of my pet peeves is when someone comes back to me and says, but he had or she had good intentions, right? Intention has nothing to do with this conversation because impact is what's relevant. It doesn't matter what your intentions were. They're, they're irre 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 irrelevant, thank you. Sorry, the, the French thing. Irrelevant um, with regards to this conversation. So, and when, when people use the term intent or he, he had good intentions, he didn't mean it. What they're trying to get that is this idea of ignorance, right? Or they didn't know. And so um, the literature actually talks about this idea of white ignorance. So first I'm gonna define the dictionary definition of ignorance, which is this idea of this lack of knowledge or information, right? So if someone is ignorant, they, they lack knowledge or information. The literature actually talks about, you know, um, this idea, Charles Mills wrote a book that's called The Racial Contract, and I'm just gonna summarize it real quick. And the idea of the racial contract is really, um, it's implicit, right? It's this contract that has been, and as a white person, if you dig deep, you'll know what I'm talking about, right? And people of color know this too, because they see it all the time. Is this contract that's forged between whites who present a way of being in the world that ignores racial sub subordination. So this whole presentation that, uh, that, that I just had on how, you know, um, racial ideology is perpetuated, how is masked within the system, how we're taught to ignore racial subordination, using colorblind ideology, using white emotions, right? We're actually taught, it's this contract, right? We're supposed to act white. And from a very young age, we're taught and brainwashed and coerced through fear and violence, right? Because if you don't, if you don't follow the in-group laws and informal contract, you're going to become an outcast. I'm going to withhold love from you, right? If you bring that black child home again, you know, they may not say black, but they say, if you bring that child home again, I'm going to ground you. Or, you know, if you marry this black man, I'm, you're, not my, you're my, not my son or daughter anymore, right? So these are contracts that are forged this idea of this racial contract that Charles Mills talks about is very much embedded within the society that we live that we live in. It's inherited, right? We've inherited this as a nation, this racial contract that exists between whites, which is why when a white person chooses not to act white, so um, Chuck, I'm gonna pick on you because you shared the story about um, the, the racist incident that you had in, at the dentist office, you know, where, um, um, Chuck, do you actually just want to share the story really quick to talk about this racial contract? 
idea? Do you uh, well, I, I kind of did. I think that this, uh, what, this white hygienist made the mistake of thinking I was a, a white person in, in the contract with her about what whiteness is. And, uh, you know, I found out, I hope uh, that, I'm, that I'm not. But yeah, it's, it was just an assumption she made that, that, that I could hear that and I would be on her side. Right, right. And then, and, then, and then you chose not to act white in the way that you followed up um, yeah. with, with the conversation and, and the business, right? right. Um, and that wasn't expected because had she known you would have done that, she wouldn't have brought you in and talked to you in, in a very specific way. And this happens all the time, right? When a white person kind of bends over and starts whispering something in your ear or kind of subtly tries to imply something racist. Yeah. They may not actually say the racist word, or they may, right? But there's definitely racist intent there. That's part of the racial contract. And they expect you to laugh or to think it's funny or to, you know, be okay with the perpetuation of this racial ideology um, within this in-group. And so I want to show this video to you. It's kind of an uncomfortable video, but I think this is going to show you. I don't know how many of you have seen this video. Um, this is a white girl talking to her parents. And then we're gonna just talk about it after we watch it. Do you know how many- I actually, no, shut up. No. Can you shut your mouth for a minute? No. Cause I actually work in the ghetto. I see the people. Do you know why I they're in that position? I see these people. Do you understand the systematic and historical reason for why they're in that position? They don't care. All they want to do is be ghetto. No. Yes, there's no. some that don't and there's good people. No. Members, most of them just want to suck off the system or do something bad like drugs or gangs. And that's all they They have about. been oppressed. They have it not been given matter. the they same the opportunities chances. you have yes, had. They do. And there's plenty of black people. No, they don't, there's plenty Dad. Of, there's plenty of and you not recognizing that as an issue is the reason why it's still continuing today. I see them all over. There's all kinds of successful people that are of color. It doesn't matter what color, brown, white. But it's orange, a lot harder yellow. for them to get to that it position. It doesn't matter. When they do, they're fine. But there's always filthy animals. And that you're calling you're calling people of color black no. animals. You're calling them animals. I'm you didn't let Are me you finish. kidding me? You didn't let me that, finish. That's not okay. No, no matter what, that's not okay. No matter what, it's it not okay. okay. Racism is not okay. Why do you think the racism is okay? <laughs> Oh, that's mine. Really, I'm gonna look at. No, I'm looking at statistics right now. Your statistics can't. They can be warped. Statistics can be warped. You want to show? You want me to show you videos? Do you want me to show you videos of cops? Why is? I will do it. Statistics wrong. Because they can be warped. I'm not giving statistics right now. They can be warped. Personal experiences can't. No, because this is actually putting it into play. When you, do I need to show you a bunch of videos of cops attacking protesters, problem. peaceful All protesters? Just listen, listen to this. This is the number. You mean I'm informed and educated? You're not, though. You're, yes, I am. You're one-sided informed. Yes. Mom, I was watching political stuff, and you said to turn that off because you don't want to hear about it. Because that I'm means I am educated it. on I'm it, and you are not. It. I'm sick of hearing it. The fact that you can have that ignorance, really, ignorance for the majority is bliss. Okay. So ignorance for the minority so I'm is looking at destruction that are wrong this is just pure wrong information out there just give me the statistic in 2017 457 white people were shot to death by the police in the united states okay 223 were black 76% of the population is white 13% is black. I if, that. if they were being killed at the exact same rate by police officers, the rate of black people being killed would be 8.9. But it's not. It's 24%. The rate of white people being killed should be about where it is. So they're being killed at a higher rate. There is more white people, meaning that the amount of people killed by cops who are white would be higher. The reaction of the person. I'm not saying it's, they're I'm tired. not saying it's they're tired right. of being treated. I'm that not way. saying it's right. Good. But if they started teaching them that this is the world that we live in, you don't want to be killed. Why do you think your friend's father taught him that? Because so that his, this so his that black he, son doesn't end up dead like Tamir Rice. Because he doesn't want him to grow up with the chip on his shoulder that he doesn't no want his black son to end up dead. 
Exactly. That's not okay. Why do you think that's okay? Because why is it something that you're okay with? Why is that I'm a reality not, that you're okay with? I'm okay with it. But you are. No, I'm not. I'm so saying... stand against it. So stand against it. If you're not okay with it, so stand you against it. Stand against it. When the black people in the ghetto stop carrying an illegal weapon. When the black people in the ghetto stop murdering each other. I'll start caring about cops when they stop killing black people. Um. I'll start caring about black people and they stop killing cops. So I just want to take a few minutes to think about what we watched. There is a lot there. Um, I'm showing this video because, you know, oftentimes what, what I love about this video is that this girl had the courage to actually videotape her conversation uh, with her parents. These are conversations that happen consistently uh, within, within white families. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to generalize it to all, all white people, obviously, but there's definitely a collective um, feeling in terms of, you know, what you're expected to believe, how you're expected to um, behave. And um, Haley Clark, who's the girl in this video, is actually, I think it's a good example of how she's kind of breaking this racial contract, right? Um, that, that this implicit racial contract um, that she's supposed to follow and she's not following it, right? and she's pushing back on her parents and she posted this on social media so i heard a rumor somebody told me that she actually ended up in jail because of it i was never able to substantiate that that piece of information that she actually that her parents somehow got her in jail for a while after she posted it on social media but even if she did it, it what, what if it was true i wouldn't be surprised right because um the the backlash that happens when um when when white people speak out is real as well and so i just want us to take a minute to think about this video and not necessarily the disunity happening i'm not condoning yelling and screaming and right um i think that there are ways to also have um discussions around this that don't necessarily reflect that but at the same time we also have to acknowledge that white emotions are employed for a specific reason right and so not to just think of this as oh they're just yelling and screaming at each other but how are these white emotions being employed um, within this context to support this white supremacist framework right um, and then i and we're going to talk about it in a minute but also <sighs> what i would like to to emphasize is that we we do have a choice as baha'is right and I, I and within the broader community as um people um in in our societies in our communities we can choose to act like Haiti's parents maybe not as explicit or maybe not with the same specific types of beliefs right but but still perpetuating perpetuating them in some ways or we can choose not to act white and by breaking that racial contract and that racial code um, that we're taught to to follow that we're taught to follow right and so um just real quick what are some emotions that Haley clark's parents used in that video anger anger white anger what else that this is just how it is and why should she you know stand against it this is how it is mm -hmm. like this entitlement of that this oppression of the black is okay because that's just how it is mm -hmm. a willful ignorance which was referred to of course referenced a couple of times a willful ignorance on the part of uh, the parents, even the one who so-called worked in the ghetto, just the term of him using the ghetto, all the judgments that are wrapped up within in that. And in the neighbor black, well, the black person that was black father that was being referenced, who was preparing his son, 
The mother said he's preparing his son so he doesn't walk around with a chip on his shoulder. Uh, that sounds like, you know, um, confidence. Of course, we know the whole cliche of uppity and all of that. So that so that he will act in a demure way whenever he's in a situation that could cost him his life, as opposed to it being expected to be treated by law enforcement in a just manner. Thank you, Bart. There was a lot of investment in throwing up statistics, whether they were accurate or not, to justify keeping things the way they are mm -hmm. and continue the assumptions and the, the stereotype. She was trying to break the assumptions with data. And I, I could imagine this conversation could have been peaceful and calm if people were not invested in some way in keeping the status quo. If you're invested, you're going to get all bent out of shape if somebody presents some new information or different information that uncovers, unmasks, or unveils uh, uh, a different reality from the one you think is true. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kathy. And you know, and I think it's important to emphasize that at the collective level, we've been taught to use these emotions and employ them in a very specific way, right? So I don't want anybody leaving here thinking that I'm attacking them at an individual level, but really I'm, 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 I want us to understand how these emotions are political, right? Um, and uh, political is not the right word, but I can't really think of a different word to use, but you know, how, how, how they're used to get, to, to serve a very specific purpose and how we're taught to use them and, in a very specific way. This isn't a, an emotion, but um, they just had, their minds were made up, you know, and they had a complete certainty that they were right based on their lived experience and based on, you know, their perspective. And so there was, there was no room for uh, an open-minded dialogue. Mm -hmm. And I think you could see the frustration in their daughter because she has her mind is, is seeing it from a, a new perspective and she and so it's triggering on both sides because the parents are just completely decided that they're right and the daughter is decided she is and uh and so that causes frustration and that's going to lead to conflict mm -hmm. yeah thank you for sharing that for sure um, I, I saw maybe something uh, along the lines of maybe shame, like covering up um, like people who feel ashamed of, of maybe their privilege being pointed out, covering up that shame by reacting this way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for noticing that, Jamie. There was also a prioritization of their own um, comfort like the mom said in response when she asked her daughter to turn off the TV that she's tired of hearing about it mm. um, as a way of deflecting the conversation. Yeah, yeah. Right, and, and also it, it points to, the, to our own privilege that we can just kind of walk away from it, right? We, we don't have to deal with it if we don't want to. I could walk away from my critical race work and never think back about, about it because of the, my white privilege. I can just move through the world, you know, move on. Um, obviously, in, in, in a spiritual way, you know, white, white ideology dehumanizes us, right? And we can't forget that, that even as white people, we've, we've been, we're being, de we're, we're dehumanized when we're brainwashed, right? And we're forced um, into this white group kind of rhetoric. Um, and so thinking about ways that we can break out of it is what, what, what's, what's important. So this is just a trigger warning because I don't want to, um, I just want you to know that um, the next slide just shows a picture of Derek Chauvin uh, kneeling on the neck of Mr. George Floyd. And so I just wanted to give you that trigger warning because I know it's, it's traumatizing right now based on the uh, current climate. Um, so actually Chuck shared this picture with me. Maybe um, I can't remember when, but a while ago. Um, so, you know, we can get into a huge discussion around this. But what I do want to emphasize here and what I want to focus the conversation on first 
is to, to, to look at this picture and tell me what emotions do you see in this picture? If you're talking about Derek Chauvin, Liz, to me, it seems like indifference. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I am. Thank you for, for, for clarifying that. I am talking about Derek Chauvin, the, the, the white emotions. Indifference, right? So I want to get at this emotion um, called white apathy that often we, we employ, right, to sustain um, this white supremacist framework in different ways. So kind of like this idea of walking away, like, I don't care. What does it have to do with me? Um, kind of white apathy, the, this kind of feeling or silencing, right? White people just shut down and they're like, I just don't want to have this conversation anymore. I don't want to talk about it anymore, right? Um, so white apathy, we often talk about white rage, white fear and all of these different emotions, but sometimes white apathy is kind of ignored or not necessarily talked about. And it's a very powerful emotion um, that is used to sustain racial ideology. Anything else you want to talk about about this picture? It's lethal. His indifference is, uh, I, I'm, I'm privileged, I can get away with this, I can do this with impunity, nobody's going to touch me. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking right at the camera. For eight plus minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm above the law in a way, right? I have the authority, I'm entitled. Anything else? There is a question about what the picture on the right is. And I might just say, um, I think that it was a miscaptioning uh, of these two. These are two separate people. Um, is it? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good to know. I reported on it, yeah. Okay. This but is Bart was... again. I, mm -hmm. I just wanted to say too that you probably have seen that recently the, uh, a transcript of the conversation that was recorded by I, either by the, uh, I guess by the uh, woman who was uh, recording the incident or a police um, camera, probably the former, uh, when one reads through the transcripts of the conversation that was happening between the police officers, it becomes even uh, more sickening. Mm -hmm. It's funny to me that people see um, like apathy because like his brow is furrowed and to me like his eyes are, are kind of pointed and so I see somebody who's angry. That's a good point. Yeah. Could it be revenge? Mm -hmm. that, yeah, I, I, I was trying to get a, a you know, a, a good close up. Um, and look, he, he looks almost like there's, um, uh, like he's trying to contain rage. Look at his eyes, mm -hmm. you know? And we know that he, um, Apparently, it's been said that he did not have a favorable um, feelings toward people of color. Um, you know, that's been reported. And it's almost like, you know, I've got this opportunity and I'm taking it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. it's like, I don't care what you want or the fact that you're filming. I'm, I'm doing what I want. For, for me, what came up was the fact that he is in a situation where he is uh, uh, in a way being captured. Uh, he is being uh, captured by video. And when I think about the stress, I don't sense that, that any of his uh, stress is necessarily being uh, directed, you know, because of what he's doing, but rather the fact that he's being captured doing him. I mean, this isn't a, a situation where Floyd was, uh, you know, running, shooting, firing, had really attacked. I mean, it looked like he had resisted at one moment, but uh, it seems like to me, whatever's 
racing through him. I, not to project, but I wonder if it has to do with the fact that he's aware he's being captured and he cannot get up off the neck to do something to the person with the camera. So to me, that's where I see the stress being created there, the fact that he knows he's being captured. There's also a conversation going on about his hands in his pocket. Um, and to me, I see uh, like a sense of righteousness in the job um, that like, you know, police immunity sort of in, um, in action. Yeah. And uh, Ella shared confidence, self-assurance, um, and then fear, pain, hopelessness, and doom uh, in the face of George Floyd. I don't know about you all, but the sunglasses just really trigger me. Like, he, he just, uh, he, he still has like these sunglasses on his head as he's sniffing the life out of someone, you know? Um, that really impacts me for some reason. I'm a white cop, I get to do this. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I mean, it's clear that he's not scared. I think to me, it doesn't matter or not, because I think when, you, when somebody pointed out a little bit ago in the chat that he has his hands in his pockets, and it's like he's just as calm as if he was like writing up a report, like doing paperwork. Mm -hmm. You know, he's so incredibly nonchalant uh, about it. It's, you know, it's like being a Yeah. All right, friends, I just want to move on real quick through the last few slides because we don't have a lot of time and I'm way over time, I realize that. Um, so these are just some of the white emotions and I hope that, um, you know, our discussion has kind of helped enlighten the conversation around white emotions and how they are employed, um, how the literature talks about the way they're employed to sustain white racial ideology. Uh, Tendeka wrote this book called Learning to be White, which is a really great book, and I, had, I encourage everyone to read it if they can. Um, and then she just, we've talked about white shame, but, and I've kind of emphasized what she's talking about here, is like um, explaining the invisibility of white shame um, as a major race problem in America, right? Because, you know, um, what I struggle with is that when and what I struggle with in terms of white fragility and this concept of white fragility is that it doesn't encourage the exploration of our white chain. And until we are able to dig deep and really explore our white chain, white people aren't going to change, right? They they actually have to do the work. They have to they have to come to terms with the ways we've bought into the system. We've had to come to terms with the complicity um, that, that we have with white racial ideology. And so, um, you know, the way we've been shamed into this racial contract, right? What our, our parents, our families, the white collective has used shame to shame us um, and, and to abuse us, right? Um, and of course, the abuse does not compare to the abuse that people of color have experienced, right? But we've also been brainwashed and we've been abused into, and it's not to say, and that's not to use that as an excuse, right? But to really deeply understand this idea of white shame and how we need to dig deep and start dealing with it if we want white people to, to actually shift and move towards this idea of being a race trader or breaking the contact, whatever term you want to use. Um, and so Charles Mills, who wrote The race, Racial Contract, also talks about this idea of white ignorance, which Bart um, actually called, um, what did you use? Willful ignorance, I think, is the term that you used. And so this idea that it's not something that you don't know. This is a poem in, that Charles Mills wrote, and we don't have to get into it because we don't have a lot of time. But I just want to emphasize that this idea of white ignorance is not, is not absence of knowledge. It's this idea of a false belief and the absence of a true belief, right? So it's the ways in which we spread misinformation, right? We distribute it um, uh, across, across the, the white collective and we encourage social practices that perpetuate this idea of white ignorance or willful ignorance at the expense of people of color. So I'm just going to end with a few quotes that I think um, will just kind of summarize 
what, what I'm trying to get at in terms of quoting the advent of divine justice. So Shoghi Effendi tells us that this, these, these habits and faults and tendencies that we've inherited um, from our own nation, um, can, we, can, we can cultivate specific qualities and characteristics um, that are needed um, in our participation for the redemptive work of the faith. And so I just wanna address these specific qualities with a focus on this most challenging issue real quick. So, you know, Shoghi Fendi tells us, let, let them focus their attention for the present on their own selves, their own individual needs, their personal deficiencies and weaknesses. So he's telling us before we need to solve the problems of the world, we first need to focus our, our attention our own, on our own selves to think about how are we going to develop these distinctive characteristics, right? Um, and how are we going to address our individual new needs and address our personal deficiencies and weaknesses? And, you know, I want to relate this back to, to what we have inherited as a nation, which is white racial ideology. The Guardian specifically asks us to, to focus on it, right? And that it's important to, to, to go inward and to start focusing on ourselves and how, how we have to work through all of these, um, all this brainwashing and abuse that, that we've experienced, right? Um, and so what are these spiritual prerequisites? I'm just quickly gonna talk about rectitude of conduct and um, the eradication, 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 era of racial prejudice. Um, and I do believe that they go hand in hand, right? Um, and so uh, for rectitude of conduct, the Guardian tells us this rectitude of conduct with its implications of justice, equity, truthfulness, honesty, fair-mindedness, reliability, and trustworthiness must distinguish every phase of life of the Baha'i community. distinguish every phase of life. And then he goes on to say, be fair to yourselves and to others. He thus counseleth them that the evidences of justice may be revealed through your deeds among our faithful servants. Equity, he also has written, is the most fundamental among human virtues. The evaluation of all things must needs depends on it. And again, Observe equity in your judgment, ye men of understanding heart. He that is unjust in his judgment is destitute of the characteristics that distinguishes man's station. And so friends, when we think about rectitude of conduct, the guardian is really asking us, Shogi Effendi is really asking us to focus one on our own selves, but also to, to focus on justice, on equity, to observe equity, um and and um hold on just one sec sorry and so for me you know i just want to end with this slide that that kind of says and and a final question so he also tells us that it is through your deeds that you can distinguish yourselves from others and i want to connect it back to racial ideology right and so I want us to think about everything that we've, we've kind of grappled with today and to think about how we are going to do this. So how are you going to distinguish yourself from others through your deeds as it regards this most challenging issue? And so I've given examples of what white emotions look like. I've given examples of what potentially it could look like to break that racial contract, right? Uh, to not act white, as some people say. And so to think about this rectitude of conduct and the deeds and, and to connect it to deeds, right? Are, are we being asked, are we being asked to, to be a race trader in some ways, right? How, how, do we, how do we fulfill our own covenant to Baha'u'llah and um, follow the guidance of Shoghi Effendi within the framework of, of this white supremacist ideology, what would that look like in terms of deeds? And so it's really, it's just my challenge to start, to have you start thinking about how will you in your own life distinguish yourselves 
from others through your deeds as it regards this most challenging issue. That's my challenge for you today. I don't know, this is the last slide of my presentation. So if there are any uh, final thoughts or, um, you know, I know I went through the last few slides, slides pretty quickly. So if anyone wants to make any comments, please feel free. Uh, there was a request uh, to go back to the slide of emotions where you had the list. And then Bart asked um, if you could focus uh, briefly on more subtle manifestations of white emotion that might be more common um, mm -hmm. for us to sort of observe in our own processes of uh, self-education. Mm -hmm. So we have white fear, white rage, white disgust, white apathy, white guilt and shame. White empathy is actually a positive emotion that it, so I, I got this, I, I listed it in my references. I should put a reference on this, on this page. Uh, this is a list of emotions that I got from a chapter, a book chapter by um, Dr. Spanierman and Cabrera. And um, these were some of the white emotions that they were talking about. But white empathy was actually an anti-racist emotion of the ability to really connect and empathize with the pain and suffering that people of color have experienced. So um, that was a positive white emotion. The, the rest are, are negative emotions. All right, can I move on, Jeanette? I think so, yeah, thank you. Okay, um, so Bart, would you help me out? Sorry to put you on the spot here. Do you, can you think of any white emotions more and more discreet? I, I, I can think of one if I just have like a minute to think about it. Um, I can tell you kind of what's behind it. Uh, okay. We can look at these uh, gross examples of, uh, of, of people who are, are doing, uh, behaving in a certain way that's obviously showing where they are on this issue. But then, and we can, uh, it's very easy to say, well, I'm not like that. And so, and therefore, uh, I, I just, I'm, uh, that's what I'm thinking. So it's very easy to create a, a, a dichotomous uh, mm -hmm. position here. And yet uh, the, the issue is so subtle. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about those very subtle and sometimes subconscious emotions like i i think i remember one time jesse jackson said something where he said if i uh, if i'm walking down the street and i hear footsteps behind me and 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 i turn around and it's three white men i feel relieved and i'm ashamed of that and so and so that our whole idea of what what is a, a what's a false suspicion what what are those more subtle emotional feelings that that we might put a name to or just shine a little light on so that we could uh, be a little more sensitized to uh, um, uh, finding them in ourselves. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that helps or hurts. No, it, it does definitely help. Um, there's this other presentation that I had done. It makes me think about this, uh, to relate it back to this presentation I did maybe two months ago on the white gaze um, and talking about how and this is related to emotions, right? How we perceive, how we're, because of, through this filter of white racial ideology, how we perceive um, people of color and then how we project that perception onto them regardless of who, who they actually are, right? So um, this, this, um, this example that um, George Yancey gives is as uh, of the elevator phenomenon where you know, as a black man, I'm in an he's he's in an elevator, and then a white woman enters, right? And the dynamics completely change, right? So you see the discomfort in the white woman's face, right? She's clutching maybe her purse. There's this threat, this uh, sexual violent type threat because of all the racial ideology and the filters, right? That she's filtering through in, in terms of her own white imagination and what's happening. And he describes it in such detail. And then, and then he talks about, you know, 
how how it's almost paralyzing right and it talks about also and he also talks about this double consciousness right of you know who who he's being perceived at in that moment based on you know the ideas and emotions and body language that are being projected onto him versus who he is right um as an individual and and holding on to that identity um within that moment and kind of you know wrestling with the tension within that space um and i think we do that in our in our everyday life right we're taught we're taught um just things that as a woman i'm taught to do like for example always have my car keys in my hand before i went before i enter a parking lot so that i can you know immediately get into my car even though it doesn't seem racial or or locking the door to my car door right I mean, we need to be honest with ourselves. Who are we imagining attacking us, right? Mm -hmm. e even though it doesn't seem racial, there are certain emotions that come around um, that uh, around fear that are often racial, but we don't necessarily acknowledge them as racial. And mm -hmm. um, you know, um, and so the, these very subtle ways. Um, another one is maybe, you know you're walking down the street, you see a black person with something and you're like, oh, that person doesn't deserve that. Why does that person have that, right? Um, that's another example of a very subtle emotion where we think that we're entitled to something and a black mm -hmm. person isn't, especially when it has to do with wealth. Um, you know, one thing came up that just as you were saying that, it reminded me of thing at the Pupil of the Eye conference, this person shared this uh, person of color shared that they were speaking at a at a baha'i event and it was a weekend long conference and they were speaking at a baha'i event and then the the event had ended or there was a very long break and they had gone to a convenience store and when they were in that convenience store they came they walked by a family who had been at that conference the entire weekend and this person of color said hi to this family and they they were not even looking and then they didn't recognize the person and then after just a, a a couple of words exchanged they were you know doubling back and trying to say oh i'm sorry we were distracted etc 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 but what it really showed is it showed the social avoidance that this white baha'i family turns on the moment they leave a baha'i center and so to me, when I think one of the subtle things I think about is as a white person, do I go out of my way to see people in even the most common ways as I'm passing them in the street, as they are checking out, as they are who under what, no matter what circumstances. But it seems like this, this issue of white avoidance is a social avoidance would be a very, uh, easy yet yet powerful way to begin to explore uh the emotions we have how is it that we and, and once you it's almost like if you say don't think of a pink elephant the yeah. moment once you start looking at the white avoid the the white social avoidance that happens between white people and black people once you start looking for it it blows you away at how prevalent it is they can say hello to this person, that person, a white person will walk by the entire, it, it's much more subtle than a, a purse clutch. It's, it's just, a, and, and everybody knows what's going on. Yeah. But it's almost like the white person doesn't know that the black person knows, knows that yeah. that's going on. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting that you describe that because um, some of my favorite uh, writing uh, by Bell Hooks and James Baldwin talks about, you know, uh, that they, in order for them to survive, they've had to study the white person, right? And 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 it angers, it brings, it, it it really raises this really strong emotion of like anger and fear when white people realize that oftentimes black people know them better than they know themselves, right? Um, because they've had to observe them, they've had to observe how white ideology functions, right? In order for them to preserve their own survival. And James Baldwin does a really good job explaining um, that dynamic um, and other scholars of color do too, um, about this idea of like the, this, um, this consciousness that we have, like the way white people think 
that black people perceive them is very different than, than the way black people actually perceive them and vice versa. Um, so thank you for sharing that. If my, if I may say a personal example, yeah. um, I'm from Peru originally. And I mean, obviously racism exists in my country as well. It's just, it's, it's portrayed differently. And so learning about my own racism, I always go back to the workshop I attended with Chuck Egerton and James, um, Bob James, because it really impacted me and it helped me see my own prejudices and, and racism, especially within my new context. I actually had fear of the United States. I didn't want to come to the United States because my mother had told me these horrible stories when I was, she came to the United States when she was, when I was six years old. And she told me about, you know, the division of how uh, blacks had to sit in the back and had to drink water from somewhere else. And I was just like, what? That's not possible. So I had developed these uh, prejudices and didn't want to come here. But from all places, I came to Nashville, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. A Baha'i family brought me. And then I took this, this workshop in, 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 in the topic of media, for example, you know, what media does, you I used to watch a lot of television because I wanted to learn English, you know, and how it penetrates you without you even notice. So this is something I didn't think I would do in my country, but I did it here. I would pass to certain neighbor neighborhoods in, in Nashville, and I would feel, I had my windows down, but when I passed certain neighborhoods, I felt like I had to put my windows up but I didn't know this about myself until I watched this film that you mentioned, The Color of Fear. And just like this tiny example, we do these things all the time and we don't know we're doing them, right? So, and then I thought about, you know, like, will I do this if I go to certain neighborhoods in Peru? I think the context will be different. It, it may be more, because in Peru, it's like the, the extreme is more with like poor and rich. Mm -hmm. not saying that uh, racism does not exist because I think it does, yeah. but it, you know, then my reaction would have been different, but based on that judgment that I have been raised, cause you, you're, you're giving ideas constantly and you without noticing start behaving and acting the same way. And I was like horrified at myself. <laughs> like, Oh my God, I do this. You know, like yeah. I, I, I don't believe, I believe that human beings are equal and they were united, but I still behave this way. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm I'm really happy you brought this example up, Roxana, because I've been I've been struggling with my with one similar example in my own life that happened the other day. Um, you know, I was going downstairs because my daughter is taking tennis lessons, and I always feel the need, and it's just like one floor up, right? And I'm sitting right in front of the stairs, and I always feel the need to lock my door, right? Because I, once again, as a woman, I've been trained. You know, any man can sneak in there and um, wait for me, right? <laughs> or my daughter or whoever goes up there, right? And so I've been, it's been like pounded into me in terms of uh, safety and, and just keeping myself safe to lock my door. And I'm like, why am I locking my door when I'm just going down the stairs to watch Eva play tennis? I'm like literally sitting. I mean, of course, there are two stairways. So the only option would be for my neighbors who are already in their homes to enter my apartment. And I've been struggling with that, right? Because I'm, I, I, I was thinking, well, is this something racial? Like, is this, what is it about, is this part of this ideology that I've been trained? Like, there's nothing dangerous about my neighborhood. I don't know why I feel the need to lock my door, right? And so just even struggling and kind of wrestling with that tension, trying to figure out, okay, is this like some kind of underlying racial, racial thing that I'm not necessarily aware of, what have I been taught, you know, um, and how am I applying it to my day-to-day -day life? So I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not telling people not to be cautious, but in terms of like, you know, women and safety, but it is something that we have to consistently question and, and just kind of wrestle, you know, George Yancey talks about this idea of self-criticality to always be uh, critically thinking about what we're doing and the reasons why we're doing them to just actually just ask the question, like, why am I doing this? Why do I feel the need to lock my door every time I drive by a homeless person, you know, or anytime I draw, drive by a, a black neighborhood? Like, why? Why am I 
why do I think there's a need? Is there is there actual danger, or have I been taught to do that? No. And we have a comment uh, in the chat about whether this is all racial ideology or whether there's uh, out of proportion levels of black criminality. Um, and to that, I would say, and then I'd love uh, to hear what you have to say, Liz, but um, that, the, I just need to deal with my daughter for a second. So you take that one on. Okay. Sure. Okay. Even the conception of black on black crime, like we hear that referred to all the time, people are more likely to commit crimes against people in their own community, but no one ever talks about white on white crime. Um, so black on black, black crime, that phrase is an example of how we um, criminalize in our heads um, a race. So even the conception of black criminality is problematic. Um, and then, of course, like that doesn't address the reasons why, you know, the black population uh, is at an economic disadvantage, um, the burning of Tulsa and all of those issues. So I think we have to also ask ourselves, I think it's always racial when we out of context see a black person and assume that uh, we should be more afraid of them. So we have to sort of interrogate um, regardless of the statistics and then also understand that um, where there's economic disadvantage advantage because of the systems of white supremacy, the institutions that we operate within. Um, that's like something we have to reckon with beyond just the idea of our own fear and our own safety. Hey, Emma? Emma, don't, don't call yet. I was going to say, I guess, another reason why we have to change the system, because as long as, you know, the economic system, the educational system, all of these systems continue to not support the black community, then these fears will like perpet you know perpetrate. They'll just yeah. continue. Like we have to change um that perspective. It's like you the the excuse in our mind seems to be safety. But really when I asked myself was like no, it was coming from media because I paid attention to what TV was saying. All I could see was the blacks commit all these crimes, therefore I need to protect myself was the ideology, you know, the conclusion that came. It was a fear about that. In my case, it wasn't re directly related. I mean, it was, it was a protection, but it was directed to that community. And I was like, why? Mm -hmm. Why? And would I have done that in my own country? Because we also have Blacks in my country. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and so just analyzing those pieces. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, thank you for bringing that up. And I think just to emphasize, um, I'm not exactly sure if you addressed this, Jeanette. You know, there is an intersection, right, of, of patriarchy, of gendered violence. There's also an, uh, with, with race, right? Um, and so there's definitely an intersection of how that reality plays out um, depending on people's personal experiences. Um, but I think just the, the practice of really thinking about what it is really identifying where those emotions are coming from and uh, in terms of safety you know why why we're seeking safety and who it's directed to uh Ross and i i fully agree with what you're what you're saying there um that would that makes sense so i know we're coming up on one o'clock so i think we need to wrap up are there any final thoughts there is i have one thing to say go ahead this is Catherine. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, on the, the video with the, the, the child and the parents, and you were saying that someone said that uh, maybe the parents had her uh, arrested. I can say uh, when I was living in Hillsboro, during that time, it was one, we had a, uh, my daughter had a friend who was white and they got along quite well. They actually looked like each other a little bit. But the mom, the mom had a little thing against her, against her being friends with us, and and what she did, it was not just being friends, but because she was becoming more aware of of uh, you know being around blacks, and her mom had her committed because she felt <laughs> she had her own daughter committed, and and for her to get out of that. Uh, to get out she had to do what her mom said say certain things but what I'm getting at is that uh, the mother 
did that to her own daughter to try to stop her from she didn't want her to be friends with uh with blacks but she that was her her way of doing it to her daughter putting her committing her which i thought was kind of crazy but still yeah that's so powerful thank you for that story because it shows yeah. the way whiteness functions you know it's real it's real I just want to make a small comment uh, regarding that last question that was posed, and then Jeanette gave part of a really good answer and to follow up in a similar way of, of I think the question was about, you know, but is there more crime, a higher percentage of crime coming from the black community? And it, it's really a complicated answer. And, um, but just to kind of say it in a, the same, but in a slightly different way is, you know, commenting on that, uh, well, that, uh, you know, without, without really having an in-depth discussion of the effects of oppression, um, especially over a long period of time in history, um, you know, you, that has to be part of that discussion when, when talking about that. And, uh, you know, oppression leads to lots of things, you know, um, lack of, lack of opportunity, um, desperation, um, frustration, um, all kinds of, all kinds of issues. And, and, and so in some contexts that could lead to higher percentages of, of, um, you know, crime or, or what have you. Um, but then there's other factors like, uh, you know, police officers uh, spending the majority of their time focusing in neighborhoods of color and, and looking for crimes to be committed and turning a blind eye to many crimes that are being committed all the time um, in quote unquote white collar neighborhoods, um, but they're, they're not catching those crimes. Um, but it's a really complicated, it's a really complicated thing to discuss. It could be a whole nother session, I think, but um, I just wanted to kind of add that in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing. If I could also add that in these black communities, the black community members are paying taxes that are funding police that are often not from their communities. And th that is a uh, financial means that they are building up that they have to send outside of their community that's not being put back into their community for educational purposes for health for any of the things that are that white communities often uh, are able to rely on so we, we need to really examine when we're throwing around statistics um, about who's more where crime exists why does it exist there and what are the tools of oppression that uh, we exist within um, yeah yeah, thank you for sharing that, Jeanette. All right, maybe one final comment, if anybody has one. Great, big thank you. And this uh, challenge on your last slide is where I think each one of us needs to be focusing. What am I going to do to distinguish myself um, to live up to Baha'i standards, which are so different from American standards in general? Mm -hmm. And the Guardian did refer to the patent evils of the American society. And one of those evils is our ingrained racial prejudice. So I thank you, Liz, for all the scholarship and your leadership in helping to educate uh, Baha'i community. Much, much appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, friends, um, let me stop share so I can actually see people's faces. Oh, hi. <laughs> um, 